Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. I'm living out of boxes, folks, and tripping over stuff because we can't unpack. We moved in the midst of everything that's been going on in our world. And I, because of everything that's been going on, I can't have our contractor come in to do any of the construction work. Because of that, I can't unpack, or at least I feel like I can't unpack, because if I did, I'd have to put everything back in boxes again so that it doesn't get covered in sawdust when he's finally able to come. But now I'm in a situation where finally, I, I have some cables that have come in from online orders that have taken weeks and weeks to get here. And finally, I'm ready to run some cables from one room to the next through a makeshift conduit that I created using some PVC pipe that we had at the old studio. <laughs> Not perfect, but it would work. But I can't find the components that I need in order to be able to broadcast from within the studio. I'm looking everywhere, I'm digging through boxes, and I'm just not finding my stream deck, which would allow me to do camera switching from within the main studio. So, it's all very makeshift. Like so many other companies and broadcasters, we're just doing the best that we can. This has been a very, very challenging time for all of us. Um, we moved in the midst of this. All these boxes are from our move. The studio isn't set up. I can't get everything set up, but we'll do our best. And so I'm glad to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to make it the best show that I possibly can within the situation. We're going to get better and better as we go. And things are going to get better and better as we figure out the new normal and as we finally are able to get things set up and unpacked. In the meantime, thanks for being here for the ride. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Well, folks, welcome to the show. It's Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 651. And technically, this is the first live broadcast from Studio E. There may be a little bit of echo coming off of my microphone and things like that because we don't have the drapes up and all the sound absorption on the walls and everything else, just like I was talking about there. But we're getting there. And lo and behold, just shortly after I produce that quick video intro. I found the stream deck. So here we are. We're able to do a show. I messaged my wife on Discord and I said, I, I can't find it. I don't think I can go live like I want to go live, but uh, all of these things are falling into place and I don't have everything that I need in order to be able to push go. It's a lot of stuff for one guy to set everything up and it's like moving, uh, like approaching showtime every single week since I've been here in Studio E has been like this enormous amount of work to be ready for the show. And, and so when I say this is our first technical live broadcast, well, previous broadcasts have come out of this studio, but I've had to pre-record bits or I've had to uh, record it because I couldn't go live from this room, so I had to record it and then broadcast it from the other room, so I was still here, but it wasn't technically live. Well, I am actually here physically in the flesh right now, uh, joining our Discord server through my phone, so want to say hi to Ronna Cat and Marshman GF, BP9 here with us. Yay, Stream Deck! Absolutely, this Stream Deck is a thing of beauty. And some people have said to me, well, what the heck is a Stream Deck? And 
I haven't reprogrammed this for the new space, so it still has some of our old shots, but I, I actually want to show you this. It has little tiny itty bitty screens on it, and I can, I can set each thing, so everything that I push is a trigger. So when I push news, it actually takes me to the news shots, and I can actually set up new shots and there's basically an unlimited number of shots that I can configure in here. So right now I'm on the wide shot. I could click on Robbie which I think is a closer shot and I've got these all connected to Telestream Wirecast. So, uh, but I'm not sure which ones quite work yet. I've only set up a couple for today. For example, I've got my laptop shot. So if I push that it actually switches over to my laptop. And that is such an important tool for Studio E because our production studio is in another space. So we're not actually physically in the proximity of our servers and the broadcast equipment itself. I'm physically in, I'm, I'm two rooms separate from that. So this is now connected through a USB uh, extender and that USB extender is a powered extender and it's now running through a conduit pipe that I've put in because I can't have the contractor come and do it properly. So I actually drilled a two inch hole with a hole saw and and on the other side as it was coming out it like broke the drywall. So now I'm like hmm yeah, I can't even get that right. This is why we hire contractors. Those of us who are not contractor savvy. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't wait for, for the ability to have him come in here and his team come in here to be able to set things up. So what are we going to do? Well, we've got this beautiful blue wall. I'm so thankful that just before everything dropped, just before our government here in Canada shut everything down, uh, and I mean just, like two days before this got painted, our whole studio space got painted by the painting company that, that was hired by the new landlord. So because of that, we can come in here and it looks great. I mean, I can makeshift this, I can work with this. It's just getting all the wiring done and getting everything up and running and working. So I started saying hi to those of you in the, uh, in the Discord. Albuquerque Turkey is here with us as well. Mo Maravilla, it's so great to see you. Mo actually joined us for a coffee break recently as well. Uh, of course, a lot of these folks have joined us for coffee breaks. BP9 has been there almost without fail. Uh, Marshman has been there many, many times. Um, and and so that is something that I've been doing, that the community has been doing. When I say coffee break, well, what is coffee break, Robbie? I think I should just quickly mention that. Um, it's something that through everything that, ca that the world has been going through in this past little while, I, I felt it important that we all realize that we're in this together, that we're a community, that we're a family, and that we're... Uh, here for one another. And so Coffee Break was established as a daily show and we've done 59 days of Coffee Break. So every day at noon we've been meeting on Zoom just for a small get-together of our viewers to be able to hang out and, and be able to chat and you know say what's going on in our worlds that doesn't have to do with everything that's in the news. It's a bit of a sabbatical, a bit of a break from the everyday right now. Uh, so now that things are starting to get a little bit brighter, I mean, I'm hopeful that the government is going to, well, I shouldn't say that. I'm hopeful that it's going to be safe so that our governments can say it's now safe to have Jeff come in here and have Henry come in here to the studio. I'm hoping that we get to that point sooner than later because like you, I'm tired of it. It's been, it's been burnout situation altogether and, and doing everything here by myself has been really tough because it's lonely. I want to be here with my team. I want to have, I want to have Jeff standing next to me and Henry on the other side and Sasha remoted in and, and everything else. But you know, we're all working with the, with what we're given right now. So coffee break is now at the point where I think it's going to be a weekly thing. Um, it's definitely something that, um, it, it's established itself as something that I want to continue here at Category 5 Technology TV. Um, so it's unrelated to the show, but it is, uh, the same community. So, um, so that's something that is going to be happening this Monday 
May 25th. If you'd care to join us, go on to our website, category5.tv, on the day of, about a half hour before noon Eastern Time. And by doing that, you'll see, um, if you scroll down on the homepage, you'll see the, the current link for the Zoom meeting, and then you'll be able to join that community discussion. And it's literally just a time to hang out and get together and have a coffee break and have a break from everything that uh, that the world is having to deal with right now but at the same time we're able to support one another and let each other know that we're there for each other so that's our coffee break and you'll find that at category5.tv mini marsh is joining us stormy night 3000 great to see you again noman 5 is also here who else have we got hey send me a wave in discord big kitty i see you there nice to see you um Say hello, and I will do my best to catch you. Uh, we saw Peter in there as well. I want to say hi to Peter, who is a frequenter on, uh, on our uh, coffee break as well. And we've been having a lot of fun with you, my dude. And uh, yeah, it's great to see everybody. So just saying hi. So it's been a really tough time, I'll be honest. It, and I think that you know, and I think that you understand that. And I want to be straight up honest with you because Category 5 is not where I want it to be at Studio E. Like the dream was like, hey, we accomplished this on our Kickstarter campaign. And, uh, and so we can move in and we can hire the people to come in and do everything. And then uh, pandemic dropped and everything changed. So it's not that anything is not happening. It's just that it's not happening yet. So, you know, I'm here doing my best to keep the show kind of on track as far as that goes. And, and I appreciate you being here with me. But I received a message on YouTube today that that really encourages me and I want to say thanks to David who says you guys are the best resource for learning Linux hands down thank you for your contributions to the community and David I just want to say thank you so much for that word of encouragement because right now I mean even me on this side of the camera I need those words of encouragement and I know that you need those words of encouragement we all do uh, but it's been a tough time for our entire world for everybody that is going through this and I'm going through this in a different way altogether I'm building a studio in the midst of this without the ability to have helpers coming in and helping me I'm dealing with a, st uh, a room full of stocked boxes that I can't unpack because I can't have the contractor come in. These are the things that I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with running cables and trying to be up and running in time for a Wednesday live broadcast. And I pulled it off this week and I'm so thankful. And that is largely thanks to those of you who have decided to support this show, whether it be through Patreon or through our Kickstarter campaign, with the ability for me to be able to get onto Amazon, get onto B&H Photo Video, and order the things that I need in order to get up and running, even in a makeshift way at the moment, has been such a blessing. And it's been what is motivating me and being able to keep me going. And, and, and it's what has made us uh, able to be able to broadcast tonight. So I do want to say thank you to those of you who have supported us. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to name everybody, but some folks have opted to be named. So I, I do want to say thank you to Scott Barkley and um, Ron Morissette. Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Bo Lichnowski, Bill Marshall, and everybody, every single one of you who has supported Category 5 TV. If you've supported us and I'm not naming you on that list, it's just because you didn't check the box for that particular thing. And, and I want to acknowledge your contribution, but I also respect your rights to privacy. So please send me an email and I'll be very glad to add you to that list with my utmost thanks for your support of Category 5 Technology TV. You can support us at patreon.com slash category5 uh, even still. Now our Kickstarter campaign has ended and we're safe but it does take still. I mean I'm, I'm flabbergasted that I just paid the rent yesterday 
not literally, but it seems like May 1st was yesterday, doesn't it? And here we are. It's like halfway, a little more than halfway through the month of May. And I'm going to have to pay rent again. I'm going to have to pay my internet bill again. I'm going to have to pay my insurance bill again. It's astonishing how quickly time flies, even though we're just in this weird transitional phase right now. So that's where patronage really helps the, sh the show out, because we do have those monthly expenses in order to keep the lights on and in order to keep us here at Studio E. So thank you everyone for your support. I do have to take a really quick break, and when we come back, I'm going to be getting into the Microtik. We're doing a series right now with Microtik routers, and this week we're going to be looking at how to configure port forwarding. It's a little more sophisticated with a Microtik, as you can imagine, than with your typical consumer router. So stick around, I'll show you how to do it right after this. We've been looking at the Microtik routers advanced routing with these devices. I mean, they fall into this interesting category uh, all of their own in a way because they're priced like a consumer router, but they have the feature set of an enterprise router. So suddenly you're able to do so much more. You're able to protect your network way better than you could with a consumer router. And you're, you're able to do that for about the same price, or maybe a little bit more, but about the, a tenth of the price of an equivalent enterprise level um, router. So all that said, they're extremely cheap for what you get. And when you've used a Microtik router for a little while, you start to realize, wow, there's, there's like no limits to this. It's like you can just, you can code stuff into it in their router OS software and, and you can m manage all kinds of stuff. And all of a sudden you start playing with Capsman and your mind is blown because you can do things with a Microtik router for 30, 40, 50, 150 dollars that you would be doing with a router of equivalent specs that is seven, eight hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, ten thousand dollars. And you're doing it on these consumer priced devices from Microtik. So the device that I'm looking at here at the studio is the router board RB962UIGS. And that model is what I've selected for us here at the studio. But it might not be exactly what you want for your house or your home uh, network or your business network. However, that's what's really cool about Microtik. I mean, one of the things is that it, you just pick the hardware that works for you and the software is going to be the same from device to device to device. Whether you buy the $30 unit or the $150 unit or the $600 unit, it doesn't matter as far as the software goes. Your only limitation is in the hardware. So where my device has both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi antennas and, and, and transmitters, you may buy a cheaper device that only has 2.4 or only has 5. So those features will be limited only by the hardware, but the software itself is the same. So I, I always start by saying that because I want you to understand, you don't have to buy the same one I bought. You find the one that works for you, and then you can follow along with the series. And amazingly, even if you have a different model altogether, you're going to be able to follow the screen. You're going to be able to follow the steps, and it's going to be exactly the same. That is amazing. So this week, I'm going to be looking at how to set up port forwarding, we're going to call it. Now Microtech is going to call it NAT firewall rules. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment, but we know it as port forwarding or redirecting, and that is that when someone hits our public IP address at a certain port, if it's a port that I have allowed and that I recognize, I want it to reroute to the appropriate server. So in my case, I have a server at 10.0.0.17, and that server is running Nextcloud. It's my own personal kind of 
alternative to Google Cloud Services and Drive and uh, OneDrive and all those kinds of services, I, I'm able to put them on my own server. And it's mine. It's my own hosted system. At 10.0.0.17, I need to open ports 80 and port 443. So if someone hits my IP, or I actually have a DNS record, because we have category5.tv, of course, so I have studio.category5.tv is going to route them to here. And that's going to then hit the micro tick, and the micro tick is going to say, okay, what do I do with this traffic? What am I going to do? So I have to tell my microtech, hey, that's port 443. I want to route that to 10.0.0.17. That's my next cloud server because that is presumably what this person is trying to access. So let's jump right into it. I'm going to hop over to our microtech and things are so sophisticated over here. So just follow along and you're going to start to pick up on how things work. I've clicked on IP. Last week we came here because we started looking at the DHCP server and static rules and things like that, which we'll expand upon in time. I'm going to hit firewall. These are the default settings for my Microtech firewall, and I want to add some rules that are going to reroute traffic within my network. Now, where a typical consumer firewall router is going to say, hey, I'll take port 80 and I'll reroute it, remember the Microtech allows me to have much more control over that. So I'm going to be setting up NAT rules first. That is network address translation. So those rules are going to decide, okay, if someone hits this port, where do I want to send it? Within the LAN, okay? Where am I going to allow them to access? But then it's still not going to work. Unlike a consumer router that is just going to say, okay, I'm just going to basically D, uh, DMZ that server and allow anyone to get through and allow them to hack in and whatever they want to do as soon as you say go. The, the microtech is going to say, okay, no, I'll allow traffic through, however, they are subject to some rules. You may have some other rules that you've added to your microtech device that say, I'm only going to allow a particular IP address to access this. So that might be my home IP address or my office. It may be that I've set up a rule that says, I never travel. I'm always in Canada. I'm always, in fact, in Ontario. So if anyone ever tries to access my servers from outside of Ontario, block them. But open it for me if I'm in Ontario. <laughs> so like, there's all kinds of, like it's a hierarchical kind of way of looking at those router, uh, router rules to redirect traffic to certain servers within your network. You can imagine that's helpful for home because it's giving you more security, but it's also exceptional for business. It, whether you own or run a, an IT department at a small, medium-sized business or even a large business, Microtech is going to give you so much more control over those kinds of rules. So let's start with our NAT rule. And again, NAT is a short form term that we use. It stands for Network Address Translation, and it basically tells our network traffic where to flow based on the rules that I've set up. But they're still not going to be allowed. I'm going to show you that in just a couple of moments time. So I know that I'm going to need port 80 and port 443 to route my traffic for Nextcloud. And I should start by showing you that, hey, if I actually go to studio.category5.tv, it's just going to hang. It's going to time out. It's not going to go anywhere because I haven't set up those rules yet. So that's spin, 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 but I'll leave that open. So my NAT rule, first of all, I've created a new NAT rule. So IP, firewall, NAT, new rule. And now I'm going to change the chain here. I want to say, say that this is uh, the destination NAT because I'm setting the destination within my internal network. I need to also set the protocol because I want to specify that this is actually TCP. And you can see that there are tons of protocols that you can choose from. 
I'm just setting up TCP on port 80 and then port 443 uh, to get us started. Notice too that I am using WebFig in my web browser. I have not set up or, and I'm also not using um, Winbox. And that's partly because I want to show you this through the browser so that you can see that you don't need to have a tool installed. To, to be able to ad administer your Microtech router. I think there's a misconception. As soon as I say, install Winbox and use that to connect to your router, it creates a misconception that makes you feel like, oh, this is, has to be managed from a tool. No, but that's a helpful tool to be able to give you access to your router. And it, it does provide some exceptional additional services like my, uh, multitasking. So give it a try. But I'm going to do most of this through the browser because I think that that's a, a better way to show you as you're just learning your Microtech. So I've set it to destination NAT, I've set it to TCP uh, as the protocol, which is number six, and I need to set my destination port. And this destination port is the port on the external network. So don't get confused with that, which I tend to sometimes do, because sometimes you may have a situation where your public port is different than the private port. In this case, as we're setting up our NAT rule, we are setting the external port here. So in, in my case, it's going to match the internal port, but just keep that in mind that this, it, let's say you're, you want it to answer on port 8080, you could add that there, even though the server in-house is responding on port 80. So just keep in mind that might be different, but in my case, it's in fact not different. All right, I need to look at my interface. So there's the in interface. I need to say this is going to be Ethernet 1 in my case. It may be a little bit different for you. Just keep in mind that what I am actually doing there is I am selecting my internet interface. Remember when I first set up this uh, router on our first episode of this series, I demonstrated that I was plugging my internet uh, modem into Ethernet 1, port 1. And so that's what I'm specifying here. I want this to respond on my internet interface. And as you can imagine, you can dig deep and you can set this up on, you know, you could be doing things very sophisticated by specifying different ports, setting up VLANs, all that kind of stuff. We're keeping things fairly simple and just going about it that way. All right, I'm going to scroll way down here to action and just make sure that this is set to DN, uh, DST NAT, destination NAT. So that is going to route this traffic to our server. So now scroll down a little ways here and you're going to find two ports. There it is. My two port is actually going to be the same. Notice it's giving me a, a range. I'm just going to specify port 80. And at the very, very bottom here, there's an opportunity for you to create a comment. I'm going to do that. I'm going to say next cloud 80. Finally, the one last thing that I need to add here is the destination IP address internally on my network. This is the server, as I mentioned, 10.0.0.17, because I need to say that this NAT rule is going to uh, respond on port 80 and redirect to 10.0.0.17 on port 80 as well. So now I'm going to scroll all the way up and hit OK. And now we'll see that we have a new rule called NextCloud80, and it's responding DST NAT, and it's pointing TCP on port 80 through Ethernet 1 to, as we know from setting it up, 10.0.0.17 and port 80. I'm going to add new because I want the secure port as well. Follow those same steps. I'm going to change the chain to destination NAT. I'm going to change my uh, protocol to TCP. And then I'm going to change my external, uh, my in interface to uh, Ethernet 1. Destination port. I know I'm a little bit out of order. That's okay. You know what I'm doing. Destination port is 443. Let's scroll way down here and change our action to DST NAT. And our two address, same server. Just different port. And then two port, 
443 and give it a comment here next cloud 443 all right I think I've got everything there looks good let's hit OK so now I've got port 80 and port 443 NAT rules going to 10.0.0.17 within my network from the Ethernet 1 port over TCP. It's still not going to work. So if I jump over here, I'm going to hit F5 to refresh. Oh, and it is working. Look at that. Because I'm internal on the internal LAN, so I'm not actually on the Ethernet 1. It's not going to work from the outside world yet, because um, the outside world is, um, is coming in through Ethernet 1. I'm obviously internal. I'm on port 2, as you'll remember from last week. So in order to give access to the outside world, now I need to go over to the Firewall Rules tab here and click on Add New. So this is where I'm actually saying, okay, if the firewall gets hit, I need to trigger that NAT rule. So let's do that. So we, we've added a new uh, firewall rule, and I'm going to change the chain. Uh, let's see. No, I, it's already defaulting to forward, so that's fine. Um, source IP address. This is kind of cool. I'm not going to set this, but I just want to. I want you to see this. This can be um, the IP address that you want to allow. Remember, I mentioned you could set it so that only your home network is allowed to do this. You could do that. Add your home IP address. You can even create IP groups that would uh, that would be set up here. Um, that's down here. Source address list. See that? So these are things that we're going to be learning in time. Right now, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to set a, a source address. I'm going to open this up to the world. But I, I want you to know that that is available to you. So moving along, destination address is, in fact, the internal server. So that's 10.0.0.17. Protocol, we already know, that is TCP. So click that. And it, TCP is, in fact, the default. So that just kind of saves us a quick time. But you can see all the protocols that are available to us. Next step is we need to set the service port. So destination port is going to be port 80. We're going to start with. We need to do both, but I need to set up each rule um, separately. So um, there we go. In interface is going to be my Ethernet 1 port, as we already established. And so what I'm doing here is I'm actually telling the firewall that I'm going to allow this traffic from the, um, the first Ethernet port, which is my internet connection. And this is the one where action needs to be set to accept. So this is where I'm saying, yeah, you know what, I'm going to allow this. You could also set this to reject in certain cases or, you know, various different settings. But we're, we're going to say accept. We're going to allow this and then create a comment just like we did before. I'm going to call this firewall rule comment next cloud 80. Scroll way up. And notice that if you leave off the NAT rule or you leave off the firewall rule, well, you're missing some of the chain. So it's not going to actually respond outside of your network. So you need to make sure that this is done. Next step is I'm going to add 443 in the firewall rules. So forward is already selected. Source address, we're not going to do this time around. Destination address, we're going to set to 10.0.0.17. Protocol is going to be TCP. In interface is going to be Ether one and what else am I oh destination port I need that there as well ba -ba, that is going to be 443 scroll down make sure it's set to accept and then set our comment is going to be next cloud 443 and there we go everything looks like uh, I've got everything in there Did I miss anything folks you tell me I'm going to hit OK. So now here's the final step. You notice that these two items here are drop forward rules in the firewall. Now it's important to note that MicroTik works in, in basically in order. So from top to bottom. So when you're looking at your firewall rules, if you're wondering why are these still not working? Well, it's because 
before my rules that I just configured, there's already a rule that says drop everything. So basically this is saying, hey, if you've passed all this, passed all this, passed all this, now drop the connection, right? Because these, that's a pretty solid firewall. Well, then it never gets here. So I actually need to reorder these. And the way I'm going to do that is I want these to happen. I want my custom forwarding rules to happen right after the final input rule. So I should be able to simply drag that up to here. Up, 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 up. There we go. And grab the last one, my next cloud 443 rule. Drag that up. Up, 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 up. And there we go. And now we're in. So now I don't have to restart the router. I don't have to do anything. This is, uh, I'm able to see it, but our Discord server, um, you can confirm for me. Head on over to studio.category5.tv and without having to reboot my router, without having to um, restart anything, you should now be seeing that same login prompt as well. Um, so head on over to uh, studio.category5.tv. Uh, I'm sorry, and, and BP9 is just, uh, or pardon me, Nomen5, you're just commenting that uh, when I add the comments, you're not actually seeing them on the screen, and that's because category 5 is 18 over 9, and my computer screen is 16 over 9. So that's, a, that's something that I'll have to figure out how to fix in the future. That's my mistake. But you can see those comments have been entered. It's a comment field. It's just a text field at the bottom of your uh, of your window while you're adding it. And there's that's what I entered. Next cloud 80, next cloud 443. I apologize that I didn't catch that. Um, but I appreciate you noting it. Um, so Mo Maravilla says, yep, I see the login and BP9 also says, yeah, it works for me as well. So without those rules, they would not, it would not respond whatsoever. But now that I've added those rules, now y'all are able to connect. So the next thing that I could do if I wanted to is I could set up those source address lists. And those lists can contain IP addresses of my home network, of my work network, of my friends networks, of my staff's networks, and allow them to follow through those rules, but drop everyone else so that those hackers that are on my Discord server can't get into my next cloud server, and so on and so forth. So that's essentially, you know, those are your steps. So looking, let's backtrack a little bit and understand that, okay, I set up two ports today, port 80 and port 443. Those are port 80 is an insecure HTTP uh, port and port 443 is a secure SSL encrypted um, HTTPS port. I want both of those so that if someone doesn't actually physically type in HTTPS colon slash slash studio.category5.tv, it will instead hit the port 80 and redirect automatically to 443. Uh, if I didn't have port 80 open, they would never get that redirect. They would just get a, a server not found error. So backing up, we need to go into our Microtik um, configuration. I'm using WebFig and uh, click on IP click on firewall, click on NAT tab at the top and create a new NAT rule. That NAT rule is going to tell it where do you want to go with this, um, with this port? What do you want to do with it? Uh, but it's not actually going to open up, open it up to the public. That's where the firewall rule comes in now. So click on firewall rules on that same IP firewall. And we need to create a new firewall rule that's going to accept that connection and allow those connections through. And you can further um, hone in on IP addresses or IP source groups and things like that. There are so many different options that we're not able to cover today, but you can get the idea that this is going to give us a lot of configurability and a lot of control over not only how traffic is routed through our network, but who and, and what IP addresses and what networks are able to connect through our network and how that's going to be routed once it hits our Microtech. We have to take a quick break. Stick around. Welcome back. 
back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. The chat is going wild and people <laughs> laughing. Mo Maravilla says, all right, it's time for the denial of service. Thank you so very much to my community for putting that thought in the minds of those who we just allowed access to my network. Ah, oh, that's one of the nice things about the Microtech is that it is built to reject bad traffic. So by default, if someone were to whack away, please don't, okay? Because we do what we do and we do this out of love for the community. Don't torture us. But a Microtech router is built in such a way that it's meant to drop those packets as they come in. It, it should handle things a lot better than just a consumer router or a, a, a typical router situation where um, it, we're always getting whacked away out. You're always, as soon as you connect a, um, a computer or a modem to the network, to the internet, you're going to get whacked away at. And maybe you don't realize that, but as soon as you set something up like CSF LFD, you're going to see in the logs that, oh my goodness, immediately. I mean, I've assigned servers to a public IP and immediately port scans are happening from overseas and things are getting whacked away at and SMTP authentications are being attempted. And it's just wild how quickly script bots and kitties are going at our servers. So it's important to have something in place such as a Microtik uh, router. All right, it's time to head over to the newsroom, folks. Becca's here with me. I'm going to throw it over to you. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Equifax has finally settled following their massive data breach, but as it turns out, none of the money will be going to you or me as previously promised. Facebook has bought Jiffy. Is this real life? Microsoft is now the biggest single contributor to open source. Can a computer write a hit song? We'll find out. And OnePlus is apologizing for an apparent accidental x-ray camera feature that lets users of its new phone see through clothing. Stick around, the full details are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Equifax has finally agreed to pay compensation for the massive security breach it suffered in 2017 that led to the theft of at least 146 million people's personal info. But before you get excited, the money won't be going to you, but rather to your bank, which will be paid for the hassle of having to cancel your payment cards. That's right, the credit agency has agreed to pay $5.5 million to thousands of banks and credit unions who said they were injured by their customers' details being siphoned off by hackers, and a further $25 million to beef up data security. Equifax will also cover the bank's administrative costs, attorney fees, and relevant expenses. Which raises the question, what happened to the 125 that America's consumer watchdog, the FTC, proudly announced that we would get thanks to its record-breaking $700 million settlement with Equifax. It's been more than two and a half years since they were hacked and just under a year since the $700 million settlement was met, so it's perhaps surprising that not a cent appears to be for the people directly impacted by the cyber break-in. The $125 headline fig figure, it turns out, was made with the assumption that only a very small percentage of those el eligible would actually apply. But thanks to the sheer size of the leak, the issue was extensively covered in the press, and that massively increased the number of people who applied for compensation. This forced the FTC to admit that it hadn't agreed to a per-person fine, but rather a lump sum that would be split equally between applicants. Not only that, but behind the 700 million headline figure was a different reality. The FTC had agreed to just 31 million for the pot that was to be split equally among individual applicants. The rest was earmarked for those who demonstrated they were left out of pocket by the hack, mitigations, money for states, and so on. So while Equifax settles with states and banks and hopefully those consumers who rejected the FTC's terrible deal, it seems that no money will be forthcoming for those who have gone to the trouble of trying to get the 125 they were promised. Seven years ago, Facebook claimed not to support the 21st century's new favorite communication tool, the animated GIF. Oh, how times have changed. 
Now, Facebook's newest acquisition is one of the internet's most popular GIF hosting sites. Facebook is making Jiffy part of the Instagram team. The deal is reportedly valued at about $400 million. According to Facebook, about half of Jiffy's current traffic already comes from Facebook products, especially Instagram. That's perhaps unsurprising given that Facebook's big three apps, WhatsApp, Instagram and Facebook itself, have billions of daily users among them. Jiffy was, in fact, the first service to make animated images work on Facebook. It created a workaround back in 2013 when Facebook's now laughable official stance was, Facebook does not support animated GIFs. Although animated reaction images may seem, and kind of are, inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, the deal is likely to attract a significant amount of scrutiny from federal regulators. The Justice Department, Congress, and the Federal Trade Commission are already all delving into even the smallest, lowest value acquisitions that big tech firms such as Facebook have made in the last decade, scoring them for patterns of anti-competitive behavior. Jiffy is by no means the only GIF search and hosting platform on the internet, but it is one of the largest. Several other platforms, including Twitter, use its API for GIF support. Both Facebook and Jiffy promise the access will continue. In its announcement, Jiffy specifically said, For our API SDK partners and developers, Jiffy's GIFs, stickers, emojis, etc. aren't going anywhere. We will continue to make Jiffy openly available to the wider ecosystem. With the announcements failed, what the announcements failed to mention, however, is the fact that Facebook can now have access to all the data generated by those searches and API calls from other platforms. And using acquisitions to gather data on competitors is exactly the sort of behavior Facebook is under investigation for right now. Back in 2011, uh, 2001, Microsoft CEO at the time, Steve Ballmer, famously branded Linux a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. But Microsoft has admitted it was wrong about open source after the company battled it and Linux for years at the height of its desktop domination. Now the pigs are flying because Microsoft's current president, Brad Smith, believes the company was wrong about open source. He says, Microsoft was on the wrong side of history when open source exploded at the beginning of the century, and I can say that about me personally. Smith has been at Microsoft for more than 25 years and was one of the company's senior lawyers during its battles with open source software. He adds, the good news is that if life is long enough, you can learn that you need to change. Microsoft has certainly changed since the days of branding Linux a cancer. The software giant is now the single largest contributor to open source projects in the world, beating Facebook, Docker, Google, Apache, and many others. others. Microsoft has gradually been adopting open source in recent years, including open sourcing PowerShell, Visual Studio Code, and even Microsoft Edge's original JavaScript engine. Microsoft has also partnered with Canonical to bring Ubuntu to Windows 10, and it acquired Xamarin to aid mobile app development and GitHub to maintain the popular code repository for developers. Microsoft is even shipping a full Linux kernel in a Windows 10 update that will release later this month, and it moved to the Chromium browser engine for Edge last year. Microsoft is also collaborating with open source communities to create power toys for Windows 10. And the company's now open design philosophy, philosophy may, may mean we'll see a lot more open source efforts in Windows in the years to come. We've got to take a quick break. I've got some cryptocurrency numbers for you and more of this week's top tech stories are coming up with Becca Ferguson. Don't go anywhere. All right, we don't have a crypto corner for you this week, but I wanted to still share with you kind of where things are at in the market. We saw a dip about four or five days ago where cryptocurrency values went way down. But right now, things are up like nine to 10% as far as Bitcoin goes. We're at about $9,694.08. Ethereum is at $213.12. Uh, XRP is still just a micro coin at 20 cents per coin uh, let's look at uh, at some of those little guys like well 
Litecoin is not a little guy, but I should say that uh, they're up 6.8% this week uh, at $45.14 fiat value on each individual coin. Let's see if I can find TurtleCoin on our website, category5.tv slash crypto report, because I'm curious where things are at these days. Head on over to our website, category5.tv slash crypto report, and you'll be able to do the same. Just scroll down and you'll be able to see the current value of each of these coins. Scala kind of all over the place right there. And there's our turtle coin holding fairly consistent. Uh, a little bit of a drop there, but right now sitting at a whole 115 micro pennies. <sighs> When is it going to go to the moon, folks? When is it going to go to the moon? I'll never know. Hey, don't forget, cryptocurrency, uh, the whole market is volatile. It's always changing, and we suggest that you only invest what you can afford to lose. It's a lot of fun, and it could go really well for you, but uh, at the same time, it could go all sorts of awry. So keep that in mind. Now, back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. Last week, we learned that Facebook trained their own chatbot AI using posts from Reddit, but a team of musicologists have done something similar, setting their songwriting bot loose on the social platform. A team of Dutch academics who, after an experiment in songwriting using artificial intelligence algorithms, inadvertently created a new musical genre, Eurovision Technofear. The team used AI techniques to generate a hit predictor based on the melodies and rhythms of more than 200 classics from the Eurovision Song Contest, an annual celebration of pop music and kitsch. These included ABBA's Waterloo and Lorene's Euphoria, 2012, also Sweden. But to generate the lyrics for the song A Bus, which the team members hoped to enter in the inaugural AI Song Contest this year, they also used a separate AI system one based on the social media platform Reddit. It was this that resulted in a rallying cry for a revolution, with a song that crescendos as a robotic voice urges the listeners to kill the government, kill the system. Like the notorious Tay chatbot developed by Microsoft in 2016 that started spewing racist and sexist sentiments after being trained on Twitter, the fault lay with the human sources of data, not the algorithms. Jane Spidgekvert, a student who worked with the AI and ran the lyric generator stresses, we do not condone these lyrics. She says the team nevertheless decided to keep the anarchist sentiment to show the perils of applying AI even to the relatively risk-free environment of Europop. The use of AI in music composition is now on the cusp of the mainstream as more musicians and songwriters look for tools that inspire different types of music. The AI Song Contest, organized by Dutch broadcaster Vpro, is one of the first events to take the process of using algorithms to compose original music out of academia and avant-garde experimentation and into the commercial world. When the OnePlus 8 Pro was first announced, the photochrom mode appeared to be little more than an artistic color filter. While it produces some interesting results when photographing trees and plants, as it turns out, it allows the users to see through smoke or fog or clothing. The filter seems to work by capturing infrared light that is otherwise invisible to the naked eye. There are many professional uses for cameras that can see infrared light, such as allowing firefighters to see through smoke, but it's less common in a consumer device like a smartphone. Although the company has stressed that the photochrom filter cannot see through thick materials, it apologized for creating privacy concerns and causing troubles for OnePlus users and other netizens. The company said in a statement on its English language forum, while we think this camera gives users the ability to get more creative with the smartphone photography, we also understand the concerns that have been raised. OnePlus will remove the accidental x-ray functionality from its OnePlus Pro 8 Pro phone in an upcoming over-the-air update, the company said Tuesday. It's also temporarily disabling the camera filter that can see through plastic and clothing in the Chinese version of its operating system until the update is released, choosing to leave it operational in its global OS. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5 TV Newsroom.
Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Thanks, Becca. Hey, this has been Category 5 Technology TV. It's been fantastic having you here. Don't forget, we are on Twitter at Category 5 TV. I'm personally on Twitter at Robbie Ferguson. If you'd like to follow me, I might just follow you back. We're on Facebook. You'll find us there. Uh, just do a quick search for Category 5 Technology TV. Our show is on Roku, um, so you can just find us in the channel store. We're all over the place. And of course, our website brings it all together at Category5.tv. So please check us out and um, become a part of this community. There's a lot of exciting things going on throughout all of the transitioning that, uh, that we've been doing over this past little while. And I'm excited about what's to come here at Category 5 Technology TV and ultra excited that you're going to be here with us. So hey, become a part of it. Category5.tv. Looking forward to chatting with you soon. And until next time, I'm Robbie Ferguson. See ya.